The Juneau World Affairs Council and the University of Alaska Southeast, in collaboration with KTOO, present the 2023 World Affairs Forum, Immigration, Detention and Power, Addressing Bias and Prejudice. In this lecture, From the Front Lines to the Headlines, Perspectives on U.S. Immigration Law and Policy, Executive Director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Alaska, Dr. Mayra Kimmel, discusses the complexities of working with immigrants and refugees and what local communities can do to promote integration and belonging. Thanks, Heather. And um, I also want to echo my thanks to the Juno World Affairs Council um, and to my previous speakers, too, to Warren and William and Heidi and Ari, because um, I've been in a lot of immigration conferences over in my life, and I can tell you that I've never had the breadth um, and the depth simultaneously of the presentations. Um, and so hats off to my fellow presenters. You all were amazing and a really tough act to follow. So we'll see where we get. Um, uh, it's a really difficult time. Um, and it is a difficult time for many reasons. We're gonna focus on some of that today, but I do just wanna begin by acknowledging that uh, and by acknowledging how the difficulties that we're facing as communities across the globe, how much those difficulties require us to come together in forums like this. And I cannot thank the Juno World Affairs Council enough for facilitating civil conversation about the ways that we interrelate with one another. And, and please keep doing so. Um, I'm also joined by my colleague from the Alaska World Affairs Council, Tuan Graziano. And I just, World Affairs Council organizations are so critical to making sure that we have civil dialogue and that we can strive for compassion. So I just really want to extend my appreciation for that. <clears throat> I'm gonna start with a super embarrassing story about myself as a very young person, the very first summer I came to Alaska. So I'm in the interior of Alaska. Anybody been north of Fairbanks? So very different than Juneau, right? Um, and I, was, I decided I was gonna take a canoe trip down a creek in interior Alaska that is a tributary of the Yukon River. So I get in the trip, it's supposed to be seven days long. Day five, the canoe gets swamped and I get stuck. And I'm stuck out there for another week. And my food is gone. I'm eating Crest toothpaste and green cranberries. So to this day, I can't even stomach the, the scent of a cranberry. And I can barely brush my teeth with Crest. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on the beach, figuring, my only reading at this point was Solzhenitsyn and the Gulag Archipelago, not a good book to bring with you into remote wild Alaska. So I'm there and I'm sitting on the beach pondering like, my fate and not feeling too great about it. And I'm constantly seeing a moose walk up and down the river, absolutely effortlessly. That moose had it made. He wasn't afraid of anything. And he either chose not to pay attention to me or he could care less. What I was going through, which was a complete sense of existential crisis. I didn't know if I was gonna make it out of there alive. And this moose is just wandering around in his natural element. It took me about two decades to realize the importance of that story in my life and how formative it was for the work that I then set out to do, which was to be not the moose in situations where people in my community, right in front of me, were feeling that existential pain and anguish of their personal situations. I couldn't jump on the back of the moose but what I could do in these situations is reach out a hand and say, I can help you navigate a little bit. I mean, I'm not gonna assure you of the outcome, but the least I can do as your neighbor and as your friend is to help you get through some of these systems. So it really propelled me to think uh, expansively and um, compassionately about the role that people who are in communities who have a perspective of privilege, in this case, it was a moose privilege, really also have an obligation and a responsibility to our fellow neighbors. And it's work that has guided me. It's a sentiment and a value that's guided me ever since. So I start with that story to give you a little bit of context. And I'm going to continue with my little bit of context by setting a stage for where we are 
because we, you know, we started both days with a land acknowledgement. And Alaskans are fiercely proud of being Alaskans, and we are fiercely proud of where we come from and how much the landscape, the air, the water impacts on who we are. And most people tend to disregard us or think that we are from these far-flung places of nowhere. But truly, if you tip the world on its axis, we become the center. And if you think about the fact that Alaska is equidistant from Japan to Washington, D.C. It really starts to shift your perspective about where we are in the globe. And the fact that we, are, we too are a border state, a little weirder border than what we've been talking about so far. Um, but you know, I've represented people who floated down the Yukon River or rode across the Bering Strait. People get here by hook or by crook. Um, and for them, Alaska becomes the center of their hope and their universe. For all the people who flew in and were on that scary airline flight on whatever night that was, Thursday night, you know how far away we are and what it takes to get here. And you were lucky because, again, you were on an airplane flight. We're huge also. I mean, we basically stretch from stem to stern and coast to coast in the U.S. And we're, we are not very populated. We're a land of contrasts, and we get a lot of strength from those contrasts. We're really, really old. Again, we take great pride in our, the ancestral peoples who've lived here for thousands of years, millennia. And we're also very young. We're one of the newest states in the country. The municipality of Anchorage, where I come from, and apologies to Juno, um, has really only been a city for a little over 100 years. We're really few. These numbers are actually wrong, because I did prepare this for <laughs> three years ago, um, our population has declined. I think Anchorage is now at about 270,000 people, and I think Alaska in total is a little bit lower than this. And then we're also really far between. So you all flew in here. You've driven the length of the road from the downtown area to here. That's pretty much it. Uh, there's a little bit more, as you know. But in order to get to any of the surrounding communities, you need to hop on a plane or in a boat. And that's really true for most of the state. We have almost half of the number of tribes in the United States. So we have 229 federally recognized tribes in Alaska. And the, whole, the total for the United States is about 538. And the indigenous cultures that we recognize and acknowledge are so much a part of who we are in our state, as I mentioned earlier. And we really, I think it, it's, it's a culture and a set of values that are deeply, deeply embedded in who we are. And we are a place up north that is unique. And we have a history of always getting ready. This is a, a beautiful, beautiful photo book of subsistence um, in southwest Alaska by an amazing photographer. Um, and the title is Always Getting Ready. And that's sort of Alaska's steady state. I mean, as opposed to people who are coming here from El Paso or elsewhere in the world, we have pretty dramatic changes, and we are constantly either changing our tires or changing our wardrobes, getting ready for winter, getting ready for summer. And there's a set of common and collective values that really come from that. We really pride ourselves on being self-reliant. We pride ourselves on our vibrant and vital cultures. And we really pride ourselves on our connection with place and what it means to be Alaskan. Even though change, I think, is a steady state, what we've been experiencing in our state is a difference, a pretty profound and visceral difference in the rapidity of the change. We've seen pretty stark transformations in three major areas. Um, we had a comment earlier about systems and about a systemic perspective. And what I want to sort of dive into here in this talk is a little bit about the fact that we've got three big systems that operate in our state. And there are ways of establishing synergies and establishing policies and practices that really, I think, can address all three in tandem and should address all three in tandem. We've got pretty profound changing economies. 
where we're moving from a really, really oil heavy, extractive industry heavy uh, state, and all thanks to Core Alaska. Um, so no, no shade on them, um, but extractive industries have been our mainstay and our main source of economics in the state. And recently we are moving, I think, and I hope, more into a renewable economy. Um, you can see electric cars all over Juneau. It's really exciting to see that, especially coming from Anchorage, where we don't yet have the infrastructure, but Juneau feels like it's, sorry for the pun, but miles ahead of us yeah. on that. We've got wind energy that's pretty profound in southwestern Alaska that's really changing the face of the economic outlooks for a lot of rural communities. We've got solar energy, and who would think in Alaska particularly in Anchorage and Fairbanks. In Fairbanks, you see three and a half hours of daylight in the winter. But solar energy is increasing in our communities. Tidal energy, it's pretty amazing. And our hope is that our leadership really captures those opportunities. And I'll talk about why that's so important in just a minute. We're also the epicenter, in some ways, of the climate crisis. So the, in the Arctic, the climate is changing at four times the rate of other regions of the world. Even two or three years ago, we were only changing at three times the rate. So again, the rapidity, the quickness with which we are witnessing change is alarming, to say the least. We're the site of the first um, communities in the United States that need to be relocated. There are communities all along the western coast of Alaska that are facing, again, existential threats um, and will need to be relocated to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars per community, and we as a state are really still far from figuring it out. And we're going to need to deal with this pretty quickly. And then finally, the third area of transformation that we're really seeing is in our demographics. It's really fascinating to watch. You know, when I first moved to Alaska, we really saw each other in a very binary way, uh, where you were either Alaska Native or non-Native. And I think that that binary view persists in our policies. But what's happening in reality is we are becoming one of the most diverse states in the country, especially my town of Anchorage. But if you just even look at the growth in uh, in the rates of foreign-born Alaskans over the last, from 1990 to 2021, we've gone from 4.5% foreign-born to 8.1%. That's a pretty dramatic change, too. And it really challenges our, our institutions because we're not equipped linguistically or otherwise to really be truly a place of integration and inclusion. We definitely have refugees in Alaska. Um, very low numbers comparatively with most of the rest of the lower 48. Um, but our numbers have increased, uh, and we anticipate that they'll keep going up because of the Ukrainian crisis. You can see down um, uh, we, the statewide, we have 169 folks from Ukraine on humanitarian parole. And I appreciate and really value the efforts of Juno to be a welcoming community and to really integrate and include um, and make space for some of those refugees. We also, though, we continue to have um, refugees from all over the globe. Uh, we have, I can't remember, uh, Andrea, correct me if I'm wrong, but Bhutanese speaking Nepalese refugees or Nepalese speaking Bhutanese refugees, right. So we, we have refugees from all over the world, which really, again, complicates our linguistic picture, um, but it also really enriches our communities. Most places that our refugee community settle is in the municipality of Anchorage with some just to the north in the uh, Matsu borough, and then again down here um, where we're hopefully going to be increasing our capacity to accept folks. Our immigrant population though is, is much more uh, numerically dramatic and much more varied. So w like I, I keep al alluding to, um, the immigration picture and the diversity of the immigration picture in Anchorage, in the state's largest city, really complicates things in great ways. But in our school district, we speak over 100 different languages. We have the top 20 most ethnically diverse high school or elementary schools in the country. 
in the top five most ethnically and linguistically diverse high schools. We've got 10% of our population is foreign born. And then on top of it, increasingly, we're starting to see that Anchorage is becoming the state's largest Alaska Native village. Um, it is the seat of all of the Alaska Native corporations that we have in our state. They're all housed in, even though they represent statewide, uh, they're all housed in Anchorage and they're a huge um, economic driver. And then finally, and I'm gonna talk about this more, uh, we are a member city of Welcoming America. And my goal for today with all of you Junoites is to leave here with you really dying for more information about how to become a welcoming city yourself. So that's my goal. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about that. Um, the challenges of working with the immigrant community and refugee community in Alaska are like everywhere else and like my, the previous speakers have talked about. This is nothing new, this information, but I just kind of want to um, offer it uh, through a unique Alaska lens. Um, the main challenges that we face are people who live in trauma, the language barriers that we face, the complexity of legal status, uh, the lack of services, and then the lack of really good or any public policies that are inclusive and that integrate newcomers. So I know this is a little redundant with some of the things that we talked about earlier. Um, and thanks to Warren, because all of your terminology that you put up there, you had with uh, children, children, well, it's all the same for everybody. So I appreciated you offering all that information. Um, we see a lot of people, not just refugees and asylees. Uh, so I put down the definitions here, which I wanna go into just for a second, but I do wanna also mention that um, we see a lot of people who are suffering trauma Outside of these very specific legal categories, we see a lot of, we see human trafficking victims, we see victims of crimes, we see people who come here and who are very vulnerable and so are victimized here. We see people who have been separated from family members. I mean, just every single bit of trauma that has been discussed, we see and we feel and we know people in our state because we are so small. We know each other. And it is, I challenge any of you to say, no, I don't know anybody who's been in that situation because I will bet money that you do. So I just wanna put a little bit of a finer point because we spent a lot of time talking about refugees um, and asylees today and yesterday. And so there's a big difference um, in terms of the benefits that you're eligible for if you enter the United States as a refugee or as an asylee. And even though it's the same motivator, that you are having a well-founded fear of persecution, and that well-founded fear is on account of one of five reasons. So race, religion, nationality, membership in a social group, or your political opinion. What's missing from that list? What's a big one that's missing from that list? And you can answer that question in the blue sweater. Well, that's now a big one that's missing, yeah. But that's not the one I was thinking of, but we'll add that. Fear. fear. Well, fear is a, you have to have a fear. And it has to be based on one of those five grounds. Try gender. Gender's been a doozy. I can't tell you how many people I have represented who have been beaten and raped and like all of the persecutorial actions that you could ever hope to find in a client, but we've lost because we couldn't prove that it was on account of one of those specific grounds. We've had to argue, yes, she was female, and she said, I'm a feminist, while she was being assaulted, or I'm Jewish, while she was being raped. It's horrific, and it is a huge gap that our federal government is not really making a lot of efforts to fill. We were hopeful for a little bit, but it's still a pretty dramatic gap. And as we know in Alaska, where we have some of the highest rates of domestic violence and sexual assault, uh, that is a population that we should be used to working with, but that really is foreclosed from getting a lot of services if they're non-citizens. Um, the other piece I really wanna just emphasize is that there is that distinction between coming into the US as a refugee, which means your paperwork has been processed outside of the United States, and you enter the US and you are able to get 
services and you are able to get public assistance and you are able to get a job and you are able to get your green card and ultimately you will be able to get your citizenship versus somebody who has fled and presented themselves at the border like mostly we've been talking about today. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the last time I checked, there was, so there are refugee resettlement camps all over the world. I think that there's one in this hemisphere. There used to be none, which meant that anybody fleeing persecution or anything horrific in our Western hemisphere did not have the opportunity of coming into the United States as a refugee. That is a stark, stark distinction between people who are coming from Ukraine or Afghanistan or African Republic, you know, Africa as a country, right? It was a stark, it still is a stark difference just because people cannot access the services that they need. Language access is really, really difficult in our state as well. So the organization that I formed along with Bruce Patello and others and that Andrea sits on the board of directors for is called the Alaska Institute for Justice. Um, and it's a statewide immigration legal service provider. We also created a language interpreter center where we train bilingual Alaskans to provide interpreter services. And it's a great idea because also it's a job for bilingual Alaskans. Um, and we really have a need in our state, again, because of the linguistic diversity that we have. Um, and also, if you see that statistic, almost 16% of Alaskans speak a language other than English in their homes. That's a pretty high number. So our language needs are pretty profound. And we just don't have a lot of services, again. But not providing language access, if your organization, no matter who you are, if you get a dime of federal funding, you have to provide language access, linguistically accessible services. Otherwise, you risk getting all of your funding pulled. It's a serious issue with serious repercussions, and we are seriously remiss in our state. Okay. It is immigration law. Um, I'm not patting myself on the back, and I'm not practicing it anymore, but it is seriously one of the most complicated areas of law I think I've heard next to tax law. It is Byzantine. It makes no sense. Um, it, it, it's constantly changing. And it's, you, I mean, can you imagine navigating that as a person who is experiencing some pretty horrific trauma and you don't speak the language? And then you're expected to do it on your own. Do, you know, forgetting the children, right? Forgetting the fact that maybe you're a minor. But these, these systems in place, and this is probably a little bit of an exaggeration, but maybe not, it's absolutely crazy. And we don't really have a lot of people in our state to be able to help folks navigate. We got a lot of mooses. We got a lot of us in Alaska who are just kind of walking down our own creek, not really paying attention to the fear and terror and lack of access that people who are living right next to us, who are sending their kids to our kids' schools, are experiencing. We have one nonprofit legal service provider in our state. We've got a refugee resettlement agency, one. We've got a group called the Alaska Literacy Program, or project, I always get that wrong, who helps with English as second language training. And they've been the default for workforce development training as well. Um, at the ACLU, where I'm now working, we're starting to look at litigating and, and really promoting policies and practices around better language access as a teeny slice of this bigger problem, but we're just starting. That organization has not been in the immigration world uh, very consistently or frequently. And then we have about, I'd say, five to 10 lawyers statewide that do private immigration practice. And many years ago, many years ago, when I started practicing, so late 90s, one of the preeminent lawyers who um, provided services to asylum seekers had a $10,000 retainer. I'm sure it's gone up, right, because that was 30 years ago. But can you imagine coming up with $10,000 
after the descriptions of the folks that you've been hearing about? And as was pointed out, I can't remember who of my colleagues said this, but because immigration is a civil proceeding, it's not a crime to be in the US without papers. It is not a crime. Deportation is not a criminal penalty. It's a civil penalty. And that becomes really super important because you don't have access to the entire Bill of Rights. Six out of 10 of the Bill of Rights was written for people who are accused of crimes. And immigrants who are here without documents have access to none of that. The only provision in the US Constitution that applies is the Due Process Clause. And also, I do just want to emphasize one thing that hasn't been said before, but all of these immigration judges that we've been talking about, they're not normal judges. They're not judges in the sense that we know judges, I mean, they do wear robes and they sit behind a big desk, but they're not in the judicial branch. They're in the administrative branch. So they're in the same branch of government that houses Department of Homeland Security, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Border Patrol, and Citizenship and Immigration Services. It's only if you can prove that you've had a due process constitutional violation that you ever get to bump into what I call a real court, where actually uh, rules of evidence apply, where you've got the protections of the Constitution. So it's harder than you can ever imagine to be in an immigration proceeding. I would not call them a judicial proceeding because they're really, really not. So there are no free lawyers. Okay, I painted a pretty dismal picture. But in recent years, I've really been working to try to turn that around because it can get, it is really, really depressing. But just thinking about who we are as a state and all of those strengths, those cultural characteristics I put up on the screen earlier, that sense of community, that we're in this together, that if I get stuck on the side of the road, somebody's going to pull over and help me no matter who I voted for and who they voted for, that, that vision that we have of ourselves as Alaskans, I'm still clinging to, even though I think that we've changed a lot in recent years. But in the municipality of Anchorage, prior to our current mayoral administration, we worked really hard to develop um, a, a two-prong approach to immigrant inclusion and integration that I will say we, we uh, is coming back alive again, but we really are trying to root that work in indigenous worldviews and with respect to the indigenous communities for whom immigration could potentially represent an ongoing colonization dynamic. So this notion of when we come, when we're welcomed into a place to acknowledge and to be aware of the lands that we are now occupying as indigenous or as previously occupied becomes a really important hand to reach out and it becomes really incredibly incumbent upon all of us who are newcomers to learn about the places that we now occupy. So our efforts in Anchorage have been to build communities that are welcoming and resilient. There's been a lot of work around the globe at city levels to build resilient communities. There was the Rockefeller Foundation a bunch of years ago that had this um, project that they called 100 Resilient Cities. And I always like to joke that Anchorage was the 101st. We didn't ever quite make the cut, but we started to model some programming around that where we were doing climate action work. And we also partnered a lot with Juno, who is a leader in that sense. But we really wanted to look to figure out how it is that we can build our community in ways that our people can withstand acute shocks and chronic stresses. We had an earthquake in 2018 that was pretty devastating. And it shut us down for a long, long time. And there's still cracks in people's homes and they're still dealing with it. And it was a stark reminder of how we come together and how we have to be prepared to deal with acute shocks. And we weren't. We didn't have linguistic materials for people. We didn't have opportunities to apply for FEMA funding in ways that were understandable and comprehensible. We have floods, we have fires. You had a flood here, I guess, last year, right? Last summer? Oh, this summer. This summer. 
uh, you know, the whole state is used to this, right? And like I said, we've got 30 communities on the northern, uh, the western coast of Alaska who are facing erosion to the point that they need to move. We have acute shocks, and those, those shocks that we're facing are really being exacerbated by the climate crisis that we're in. And then we continue, because we've never really had great policies of inclusion and integration, we continue to have social stresses that really impact on communities who are at the intersection of race, poverty, language. And so we have to figure out how to address those as well, because the impacts of the acute shocks are going to be even that much more acute when you're dealing with communities who are in chronic stress. We did a lot. We tried really hard to get national attention on what was going on in Anchorage and how we were building resilience um, and how we were looking to combine becoming an inclusive welcoming community with a response to be more adaptive to the climate crisis. So really starting to understand that those two big sectors of transformation, or environmental and equity, could really actually be addressed together to, to great benefit. So I want to revisit this with an eye toward that, with an eye toward the sense of what are Alaskan values? What can we bring to this equation, these challenges that we're facing, that uniquely reflect and really support who we are as Alaskans and who we are in our own communities? One of the big things that we did in Anchorage was we finally did some studies about what are the actual economic contributions of newcomers to our state. And we did it for the entire state, the contributions of new Americans in Alaska. So we've got that online, and I'm happy to send it to you. It's now dated. It's from 2016 or 17. Um, and the report for the Anchorage was much shorter and much more visual. And so you can see here, it's pretty profound that it, in 2014, foreign-born residents in Anchorage contributed $1.9 billion, with a B, dollars to the city GDP. That is nothing to laugh at. There was a term that I became familiar with, brain waste. And I know we all know brain drain. You know, when our young people go outside and we want to stem that and stop that. And I know that we all know what brain waste is. When you get in a taxi cab and there's a doctor driving you around because they can't get hired. Think about all the money that we're leaving on the table. If that person were able to come to the U.S. and work in their field and make a decent living, they could buy a house. They could become a taxpayer. They could go spend money in our communities. And instead, what we're doing, because we're not figuring out how to evaluate credentials, we're not figuring out how to reclassify jobs, we're not doing the basics of economic development and workforce development, how much money are we leaving on the table? And we all, every single day in this state, live this crisis that we're in of we don't have enough money. And we've got to cut education, and we've got to cut this, and we've got to cut that. And we don't have to be in that crisis. Inclusion and integration and thinking about our environment and becoming more sustainable and more resilient also helps us to recenter indigenous communities, immigrant communi communities, communities of color at the heart of maybe what could be our future economic sectors. Think about this. Alaska has always been an energy state, right? I mean, we, again, it's historically been fish or timber or mining or oil. Why isn't it renewables? Why aren't we making solar panels here? Why aren't we training people in renewable economies? We did this amazing thing in March of 2020, I think March 1st of 2020, where we brought the immigrant and refugee community together along with Department of Labor, along with the solar uh, sector in Anchorage, and we visioned 
And we thought, wow, what, kind, what would we be addressing if we could center people who have historically been at the margins, at the peripheries, if we could center those folks at the heart of our state's future? How would that change the dialogue? How would that change the racism that we face? It's pretty powerful to think about. That's me, I love that. That was a surprise. <laughs> but uh, the equity piece, the last piece of where we're transforming in our state is thinking about how can we better integrate newcomers? And how can we be more fair with tribes? So last year, the state legislature, two years ago now, recognized tribes for the first time. That's pretty shameful. We, years ago, we did recognize and acknowledge that we had 20 indigenous languages in our state, which was a huge step forward. But it was only last year that we finally understood that we had tribes. We did a lot of work, thanks to Bruce and his uh, when he was in the Knowles administration on at least acknowledging that tribes existed, but this became a, a statutory piece of who we are. We have so far to go in really addressing some of the, I think, very racist discourse in our state, the persistent racist discord in our state, the lack of understanding about the role that tribes can play, especially in resource management and especially in economic development. And then also, too, the lack of understanding about the ways that we can start to integrate newcomers. You know, we talked a lot about the horrors that people faced in coming across borders and the, the fact of the resilience, Warren, for two years that people have. What if we capitalized on that? What if we were able to figure out a way to capture that resilience, bring it into our communities when we're on the precipice of such dramatic change? What if we're able to harness that brilliance, that wisdom, that experience, and come up with some creative solutions to some of those challenges that we're facing? It would be transformative, I think, and I'm holding out hope for that. One of the ways that we're doing it in Anchorage, and again, I really hope that I can convince some of you in Juneau to think about this, is we've joined Welcoming America. We joined two or three mayoral administrations ago, so it's not really a partisan thing. It is a network of cities actually around the world now, because there's Welcoming International, with the belief that when you sow the grounds of welcoming and inclusion, your seeds will prosper. So the people in the communities will prosper, but we need welcoming policies. We need good policies of inclusion and integration. Mm -hmm. And so Welcoming America has spent a lot of energy thinking about what are some of those indicators? What are some of the very, what's the low hanging fruit, the hanging fruit that we can do to really ensure that we can become welcoming? And so they've set out a couple of things and they've set out standards so that we can know what to ask our policymakers to strive for. And then they've set out the certification process where you can actually become a certified welcoming city. Louisville was one of the first. Uh, New Orleans was one of the most recent. I can't remember, I think there's like 20 cities around the US now that are certified welcoming cities. Uh, but this is a movement that has spread far and wide. It is in Australia and New Zealand and Germany and England and Canada and increasingly and recently in Mexico. And so what we did in Anchorage is really, again, to try to connect the idea that we can't be inclusive without being resilient and vice versa, that we need to address issues of economic transformation, environmental change, and equities in one breath, and we're capable of that. We created a couple of different strategies and roadmaps, which unfortunately, under our current mayoral administration, have gone into hibernation. But we're not losing hope. There's a group of us that has come out the other side and we, we are gathering and we are thinking about how we can do this again. I will say it is a really instructive moment, much like we've been talking about the Trump administration as um, a, a shift in the way that maybe some immigration policies have occurred. It's really important in order to weather political changes that we create networks amongst ourselves as service providers and as community members so that we can make sure that these efforts sustain through 
these political changes. That is, I think, my most important lesson of many decades of doing this kind of work, is it's up to us. I mean, sometimes we get a great mayor, a great governor, a great president, but it's really, truly up to us. So I just want to end on this note, um, and so building on compassion and thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and how is it that in a state that is pretty depleted of service providers, but pretty strong on our collective will and our collective vision, how is it that we can make sure that we're meeting people's basic needs? And I've spent a lot of time thinking about how that paradigm can be transformed for us as Alaskans and what that means. And it really does mean that we need to have access, I'm sorry this isn't showing up very well, but we need to have access to basic needs all the way up to a really strong sense of community. And again, we've spent the last few days in Juneau and what is absolutely striking is what a tight community you all have here. And from Anchorage, I'm absolutely envious and keep going. And, and we look to you as a beacon for a lot of the inclusion and the equity work that you're doing here. And I'm really hopeful that we can follow closely in your footsteps. So thank you so much for having me. Does anyone have any questions? It's me again. <laughs> <laughs> I've made the case many times, including before our assembly, that Juno has an extraordinary opportunity to be a welcoming community because isostatic rebound is allowing us to rise a centimeter a year <clears throat> above the center of the earth as a reference point. Sea level rise is only three and a half millimeters per year. Therefore, as people are forced to leave their coastal yeah. communities, their real estate is underwater, they're so the new Okies, they pile everything in the SUV and drive uphill, yeah. Juno could be a welcoming community. Yeah. And we could have three times our measly population of 32,000 people if we wanted to, and if we had a really efficient public transportation system. Yeah. Well, I have some ideas on that, yeah. too. <laughs> but we could be a welcoming community here. Thank you. I agree. And you know, there, Canada, some Canadian cities, and other cities around the globe are, are actively attracting migrants. We're not and we're losing a lot because of it. But yeah, I think, I mean, for as many crises as we're gonna experience from the climate, we're also a pretty safe place. I'm gonna keep my house in Anchorage because I think that's gonna be one of the safest places. My siblings from California and Oregon and wherever, they're gonna come up when their houses are destroyed in fires and floods. DACA. Okay. Because um, I'm a language professor, I teach Spanish here. And, you know, after the pandemic, we're seeing real uh, gaps in our, our students' learning, um, even in world languages, and world languages programs are, are kind of, you know, under siege in, in most of the parts of the country. So people aren't, aren't, in the United States, we don't have a very great track or record of learning another language in school or bilingualism or multilingualism anyways. But I felt like we were making progress, and now I feel like we've lost a lot of that progress. And so I just want to mention a couple of things, and then I have a question. But um, one, I really like the part of your talk where you're talking about, like, what are we leaving on the table? And I really think that the, we have all these bilingual children mm -hmm. in this state, and, and we have a few programs that are great. We have longstanding programs for, for Yupik and Western Alaska so that children are able to develop their proficiency in their home languages, and we have some pretty stellar programs in the Anchorage School District. Juno's not really doing that great with, with languages. It's made strides with, with Klinka, of course, but um, I just, I think that that's something, it's important for children's well-being, for sure, but it's also, you know, it just opens up so many doors. So mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit about language access some more and maybe like what we can do for, for kids to develop? Yeah, no, that's great, and I think I will point out that um, I was talking in a high school in Anchorage, and a young man came up to me, a high schooler, and said, you know, my family is from Vietnam, I speak fluent Vietnamese, and think of me as a resource. I want to go into business when I grow up. I mean, again, 
six hours from, or nine hours from Japan, nine hours from DC, we are at the core of the global economy. And the power that we would have if we really took those 100 languages and not only preserved, but enhanced and taught and promoted and valued. Like the, again, our economic situation could be completely different. So I believe all of this at bottom is a question of, unfortunately, political will. I mean, we can all gather around and we need to, and we need to really start applying pressure, but we need to make allocation decisions, budget allocation decisions, that bilingual education matters, that ESL matters, and that our kids matter, and their ability to understand uh, what's going on in schools and their parents' abilities to understand what's going on in their kids' education, we're not funding it. And we're not funding it again because we think that we're so broke. So I can only speak to Anchorage, but we've really gotten rid of a lot of the ESL programs and a lot of the supports that parents have had. It also really changes the power dynamic within families when kids are the ones that are speaking English and the parents, as you know, are not able to. And then who has the power in the family? Who's the liaison with the outside community? So it really doesn't do well for family structures either. But I think, the, the again, a few years ago when we highlighted and, and passed a law that said there's 20 indigenous languages, what does that mean? How do we activate that? We need to keep, first of all, getting good policies written, but secondly, continuing to hold people's feet to the fire and say, what are you doing about this? When we first started the welcoming work in Anchorage, everybody was like, okay, great, so we're the most diverse, so what? Is this gonna end at the celebration? And it was a real challenge to think about the ways that we needed to actualize these assets that we have. So I, I think that it, it requires fundamental shifts and it does require investments. And I don't know what the answer to that is because I, you know, we all beat our heads against the wall to try to make our legislators, our governor, our own city officials understand the importance of investments and things like that. Um, can you tell me what is a sanctuary city? What <laughs> does that mean versus the welcoming? So I don't want to disagree with my friend William here, but there is no such thing in law as a sanctuary city. The, so we've dealt with this in Anchorage, which is much more red than Juneau, where, um, again, when Trump was elected, did we want to become a sanctuary city? Did we want to have a declaration? And we had immigrants and refugees come talk to advocates and city officials and say, please don't do that because you're going to paint a target on our backs. Um, there is no such thing in law as a sanctuary city. There is no such thing in law as a welcoming city either. But the difference is that sanctuary cities are very hyperbolic, very rhetorically charged. Um, it, they take their uh, name and their sentiment from the Central American Wars in the 70s and 80s when churches gave sanctuary um, and when people were, were able to stay in churches and not get picked up. And so the idea behind them is cities wanted to say, well, we're also going to do that. We're going to make it so ICE can't come into our communities and arrest people and deport them. But in fact, cities have no ability to do that. The only thing that a city can do is sign a cooperative agreement with, the, with ICE or Department of Homeland Security to say, yes, we will help you pick people up. Those are, it's a provision of law called 287G. It's in the Immigration and Nationality Act where a city or a state can affirmatively say, we're going to do your law enforcement for you, ICE. But a city cannot say, we're gonna protect people from getting picked up by ICE. They just don't have the authority to do that. So it's a, a, it's a misnomer in a sense and it has been a huge lightning bolt for people on all sides. And so really the, the notion of being a welcoming city doesn't have that. And, and being a welcoming city, there are, you know, to be a certified welcoming city, there are definite attributes. Like, do you have language access policies in your government? Do you have a uh, office of new Americans or immigrant affairs or an equity officer? Do you have, emergency materials printed in multiple languages. There's a whole series of sort of 
checklists that you go through and processes that you go through to become certified, but it has no bearing in law. It's, it's more about policy. And so I suppose, as I'm talking, you can make some of that into law, but you're never gonna be a legally sanctioned welcoming city. So, but sanctuary cities always makes me sort of shudder a little bit because it, it instills fear in me because it has instilled fear in the people with whom I've worked for years because they feel like in Alaska in particular, it will absolutely be targeted and it will inspire all of the rhetoric and the nastiness that we've had throughout our state's history. Just on top of that, I think important to know that ICE does have a policy, not a law, that says that um, there are certain spaces that they recognize right. that they will not come in and try to round people up. Churches, schools, and hospitals. Um, which is why whoever said earlier, I think it was you, right? That said um, people will drop their kids off at school and then get picked up mm -hmm. as they're driving away. Oh, was that you? Somebody oh, said that. Yeah. Right. Oh, right. Um, but they won't invade the schools. And so um, for whatever that's worth, I just think that's also in important to know. Not as a sanctuary. like I mean, right. some churches have done that where people have moved in, but more just as a protective or right. respectful. And they suspended that during the Trump administration. Um, and then, you know, I was representing um, a horrific victim of domestic violence. She ended up um, being granted asylum after many years, but she was, um, we were in her domestic violence restraining order hearing, and then INS came into the courtroom and took her into custody, uh, where <laughs> she was held and then she was released to her husband who was the batterer and she was beaten by her husband and sons and ended up spending about a week in the hospital. Um, and so there are all kinds of stories about, I mean, people, get, yeah. So there's all kinds of places that ICE comes. And you know, people think that Alaska is far away. Um, Joanne and I have had the, I was remembering our two friends who were gardening in Juneau without authorization. Um, this was right after September 11th and they were from a Middle Eastern country. And um, the two young men who had been traveling, just they'd gotten out of the military and they were here and September 11th happened and they got picked up for really literally gardening without authorization. They were getting paid. Um, and uh, you know, people think that they're far away and that there's no, there's no secu Homeland Security presence here. It's just not the case. I just wanted to clarify the context of, of sanctuary. I, I totally agree with you that sanctuary is not codified in international domestic law, but we have to contextualize the way the process has occurred in different places. Um, I, 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 I do think that, yes, I mean, I, we all, all colleagues here understand that immigration is a federal you know, jurisdiction and, 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 and you, know, you can only do so much. However, in the context of California, the level of non-cooperation or limited cooperation under SB 54, which covers the whole state, is pretty comprehensive. And that means that any public worker, all the way from a school, to also the different polices cannot engage in certain uh, acts of cooperation that might put in jeopardy the well-being and life of those individuals. So even though they cannot stop ICE doing what they do, which can be terrifying, they can go out in front of schools, they can you know, go to a marketplace, I mean, they do terrible things, but at least the public sphere in California today and hopefully the bill stays, but the whole public sphere, the 1,000 plus public instances in California cannot cooperate if that cooperation endangers the individual's life, including deportations that, uh, expedited deportation and so forth. That doesn't include uh, criminal activity, okay? So again, in, in the case of California, there has not been um, with a codification, which means that even Salinas that now wanted to consider itself a sanctuary city, well now, de facto in the jury, it is. 
because it has to follow the California SB 54 bill. And in the case of California, it has not deterred in any way, shape, or form any kind of investment because of the enormous dependency, of course, that exists in the state at multiple sectors on migrant labor, both with proper documents and, of course, without proper documents. So I think we do have to contextualize how you know, the modern contemporary aspects of the codification of what is a practice that started with religious organizations uh, is having at least, uh, it's not a solution by no means, but at least they can mitigate you know, uh, the suffering of those individuals. I would so love to see SB 54 in Alaska, and I don't think I'll live long enough to. But absolutely, it is definitely dependent on s different state jurisdictions. It is a very lovely and, and viable sentiment that comes out of the, um, the Central American Wars and is in place, and it is limited to state, you know, state by state. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really unfortunate. And I know we're out of time, but the only last other thing I want to mention is we're still even in a, in a state in Alaska where we have to talk to school districts about checking birth certificates and where we have to tell state agencies, you can't <coughs> ask people what their immigration status is. We're so far from what California is experiencing that it's night and day. And so I very much appreciate that distinction and we have so far to go. So thank you. That was Dr. Mayra Kimmel discussing from the front lines to the headlines, perspectives on U.S. immigration law and policy. It was recorded October 14, 2023, at UAS on the unceded territories of the Akhwan on Trinke Ani, as part of the 2023 Juno World Affairs Forum, Immigration, Detention, and Power, Addressing Bias and Prejudice. Produced by KTOO and the Juno World Affairs Council, in partnership with the University of Alaska Southeast. With support from Poor Alaska Kensington Mine, and Ramada by Wyndham.